is SMNI News Channel. Truth that matters. Good evening, Philippines, and good day, world. It's Saturday, April 6, 2024, and you're watching Week and the World. I am Franco Baranda, and we're here to give you a news wrap about what transpired across the globe this week. First in the news, Pastor Apollo C. Kibaloy breaks his silence amid the relentless political harassment and persecution hurled against him, saying that he will stand and will not submit to injustice. Israel is on high alert amid Iran's threat of retaliation following the attack on Tehran's consulate in Syria. Australia is set to hire an independent advisor on the death of Zomi Francom, an Australian aid worker who died while providing charity in Gaza. Mexico suspended its ties with Ecuador after the latter's police forces raid the Mexican embassy to arrest ex-Vice President Jorge Glass. And Abu Dhabi unveiled its $10 billion tourism plan. These and more for tonight's edition of Week and the World. In the face of relentless political harassment and persecution, Pastor Apollo C. Kibaloy of the Kingdom of Jesus Christ speaks out rejecting claims of guilt for the accusations, instead revealing that he is prioritizing his safety. The details of this report from Jim Domingo. Through a message, Pastor Apollo C. Kibuloy of the Kingdom of Jesus Christ bared that he was not expecting injustice, especially in his own country. Ako po ay merong mensaheng ipaabot ngayon sa mga nangyayari sa ating bansa at nangyayari po sa akin, sa KOJC, at sa lahat ng mga pangyayaring itong hindi natin inaasahan na ito'y mangyayari ngayon sa ating bansa. Hindi ko po inaasahan na, ga, na aabot sa ganito ang mga pangyayaring ito na aabot ako sa ganitong klasing panahon nang mismong umuusig sa akin ay ang aking sariling bansang Pilipinas. This is in the midst of the relentless political harassment and persecution that is being thrown against him. Pastor Polo breaks his silence to refute allegations of guilt and to assert that his actions are driven by the need to protect himself. Mga kabigan at mga kababayan, uh, ito pong aking kinakaharap ngayon Paliwanag ko po sa inyo, ako po ay hindi nagtatago sa kasong ito dahil ako po ay may kasalanan. Hindi po. Ako ay umiiwas dahil pinoprotektahan ko po ang aking sarili. Bakit ko pinoprotektahan ang aking sarili? Sapagkat ang lahat po ng nangyayaring ito sa kasong ito na napakasimple lamang po ng kasong ito, Simple case lang po ito na apat ng taon nang nakabimbin dyan sa DOJ. Pagkatapos ngayon ay binuhay na naman nila. Pagkatapos ito ang ginagawa, ginagawa ngayon na sangkalan upang ako ay kanilang habulin. The good pass emphasizes readiness to address a case through the proper legal process. However, due to the threat of an extraordinary rendition, he finds himself with no choice but to seek refuge in hiding for his own protection. Ngayon, ako po ay hindi nagtatago sa kasong itong napakasimple. Malayo po yun. Kayang-kaya ko pong harapin yan. Eh. Kaya ko nga harapin ng, sa Amerika kung dadaan lang sila sa tamang proseso. Eh. O ito pang sa aking sariling bansa. Naging complicated po ito sapagkat ang lahat ng ginagawa na lang ito, Patibong po. Bakit ginawa nilang available dito sa Dabao? Para ko'y lumitaw at pumunta doon. Tapos naghihintay yung Sergeant at Arms na may warrant to pares. Dadalhin din ako sa Maynila pagdating doon. Eh, yun po ang endgame. Extraordinary rendition pa rin. Babagsak pa rin ako sa kamay ng mga puti. Gusto ko bang o hindi. He also said that this is under the guidance and protection of the Omari Father. 
Mga kaibigan, yan po ang iniiwasan kong mangyayari sa akin sapagkat I am preserving myself. Ito po ay uh, wisdom ng Panginoong Diyos to preserve myself. Iniingatan po ako ng Ama na hindi ako pupunta sa patibong ng tao para mangyari ang kanilang gustong gawin sa akin na kanila akong uh, bawian ng buhay sa ako'y hadlang sa kanilang mga plano. Yan po ay pag-iingat ng banal na Diyos sa akin. Before ending, Pastor Polo once again reminded and emphasized to his supporters and the whole kingdom nation that he will uphold his honor and will not yield to injustice and oppression. Bansang kaharian, tatnaan po ninyo, ako'y mamamatay with honor. Tatayo ako para sa mga ginipit, kinunan ng katarungan, kinunan ng hostisya. Sa bansang ito, dito tutulo ang aking dugo. Dito ako mamatay. Bahala na, basta Pilipino ang papatay sa akin, okay sa akin yun. Yun lang man po. Pagpalain tayong lahat ng ating nakilang ama at naway manumbalik ang kapayapaan, ang katarungan, justisya sa bansang ito. Salamat po. For God and our beloved country, the Philippines, I am Jane Domingo, your citizen correspondent in Davao Region. One of the reasons for the accelerated inflation in March 2024 is the high price of rice. According to the Philippine Statistics Authority, rice prices are expected to continue rising until July. Jason Rubrico will give us the details. Jane, a small business owner, reduced the number of dishes she sells in her eatery. From 25 dishes, she now only cooks 18. She is struggling with the rising prices of ingredients such as vegetables and meat. To recover her capital and make some profit, Jane also reduced the serving size of her dishes. Kasi nga sa hindi kaya ng budget, mahal ang bibili na yun. Trans kong pa, mahal. Buti ko may sarila akong sasakyan, wala naman. Namamasahe lang din ako. Siyempre, lahat doon, binabudget mo, pati yung mga paper plate, mga kutsara. According to the Philippine Statistics Authority, or PSA, inflation, or the increase in prices of goods and services in the country, accelerated in March 2024 to 3.7% compared to February. The primary reasons for the higher inflation in the said month were the increase in food prices such as onions, pork, and rice. The increasing prices of gasoline and tricycle fares also contributed to the inflationary pressure. Based on PSA monitoring in March, rice prices continued to increase from regular to well-milled to special varieties compared to the same month in 2023. The agency also recorded a rice inflation of 24.4%, the highest since February 2009, which was at 24.6% at the time. Ang ang nakikita natin, no, uh, sinabi ko na uh, since uh, this uh, uh, commodity, particular commodity, uh, uh, started increasing yung yung prices niya at inflation. Uh, ang expectation natin ay uh, tatas ito hanggang July. Some of the reasons cited by the PSA for the continuous rise in rice prices include its increasing costs in the global market and the rising price of palay. Ang nakikita talaga natin dito yung world price kasi yung presyo ng uh, bigas uh, sa world market ay uh, continuously tumataas. No? So medyo tight yung uh, yung supply sa, sa uh, world market and uh, this uh, creates impact on our uh, local rice price. Majority of Filipinos are urging the Marcus administration to prioritize finding solutions to the high cost of living before addressing other issues such as conflicts in the South China Sea. Kasi mas marami nangangailangan ng pagkain eh. Dahil alam mo naman yung bigas, yan ang pangunahing pagkain ng mga Pilipino, di ba? Dapat priority talaga itong tungkol sa pagkain, lalo na sa bigas. So dapat talaga una-unang puna ng atensyon yung sa, una sa yung presyo ng bigas. Ang, ang hirap bumili dahil ang mamahal, kawawa naman lalo na yung mga jobless na tao, hindi sila capable makabili. Oo. So kung 
unain na muna nilang punan yung sa pagkain natin. So, siguro mas ma maayos. Saka na yung ibang mga issue? Oo, saka na yun. Kasi mas importante yung Pilipino eh. Diba? Yung pagkain natin para tayo makagalaw. Maraming naghihirap eh. Imbis bababa yung hirap, naghihirap na Pilipino. Lalong nanadagdagan eh. Kawawa yung mga bata eh. Based on the results of the Pahayag survey conducted by Publicus Asia in the first quarter of 2024, the majority of Filipinos want President Pombo Marcos Jr. to focus on addressing the high cost of living, inflation, and corruption. Marcos Jr. had promised during the campaign period to set the price of rice at 20 pesos per kilo. For God and my beloved Philippines, I am Jason Rubrico, SMNO News. Former presidential spokesperson Attorney Harry Roque commented on the possible reason why Vice President Sara Duterte continues to maintain high ratings despite the propaganda thrown at her. Kathy Villanueva tells us more. Alam ni BP Sara kung kailan dapat mamuliti ka, kung kailan dapat magtrabaho. This is the perceived reason by former presidential spokesperson attorney Harry Roque as to why until now, Vice President Sara Duterte remains the most trusted government official in the Philippines based on surveys. According to Publicus Asia's latest survey, VP Sara obtained a 53% approval and 46% trust rating in the first quarter of 2024. In the Pulse Asia survey, Vice President Sara has a 67% performance rating and a 71% trust rating. Rocky pointed out the persisting high confidence and the trust of the Filipinos in VP Sara, despite the propaganda hurled at her, which include issues on the confidential funds, the International Criminal Court, among others. According to Rocky, it's a big deal that despite these noises, VP Sara remains quiet. Kung siya ay interesado lang sa politika, anong dapat ginawa niya? Eh, dapat ginawa na niya na tinutuloy niya ng tinutula ng mga tingin niyang maling pulisya ng presidente. Nagsasalita si BP Sara doon sa mga bagay-bagay na nakakaapekto sa lahat ng Pilipino. Gaya ng peace and order, yung kanyang pagtutol sa pakipag-usap sa mga teroristang NPA. Pero pagdating sa larangan, for instance, ng uh, uh, foreign policy, alam ko na ibang paniniwala niya kay Presidente Marcos, pero nananahimik siya. Pinupulaan siya. Bakit daw siya nananahimik sa West Philippine Sea? Eh bakit siya magsasalita? Unang-una, foreign policy, yan po ay katungkulan ng Presidente. Another characteristic seen by Roque and VP Sara which he said the public likely appreciates is her ability to be her own person and not letting anyone boss her around. Meanwhile, Roque believes that House Speaker Martin Romualdez's early politicking is the reason why his approval and trust ratings continue to plummet, which is actually lower than the Supreme Court Chief Justice who is not as well known by many Filipinos. For God and my beloved country, the Philippines, Kathy Villanueva, SMNI News. Transport groups have once again come together to oppose the government's plan to introduce additional motorcycle taxi companies, especially in Metro Manila. Here's MJ Mondihar with a report. Various transport organizations have united once again to oppose the Marcos Jr. administration's plan to introduce more motorcycle taxi players, especially here in Metro Manila. Under the pilot program for motorcycle taxis, three companies have been permitted by the government to operate. These are Encas, Joyride, and Move It, while Grab has been disqualified. According to tricycle operators, they will be most affected because they will lose passengers if the number of motorcycle taxis increases. The group argues that it is unfair because both tricycle and motorcycle taxi drivers pay taxes. And they acknowledge that they cannot pick up passengers on major highways like those in motorcycles. Pero sana kwenta hindi nila kung ilang tricycle drivers, jeepney drivers, taxi drivers, at saka iba pang uh, taxi drivers and uh, UB Express drivers ang naapektuhan ng dahil sa motorcycle taxi na ito. Taxi groups are also complaining about reduced income due to increased competition. They wonder what will happen if more motorcycle taxi players are allowed. Kanina po, nang buhay ko simula ang alas 9 din ng dyan ng umaga, hanggang 3 o'clock, ang pira ko ay 600 lang. Pinangkain ko yung isang daan, 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 pinangkain ko yung isang there are currently 51,000 MC taxi slots in Metro Manila. But according to the transport group, 
The actual number exceeds 51,000. The LTFRB has approved 8,000 new motorcycle taxi units. Sorry, Chairman, kaibigan kita, Guadis. Ang usapan, gusto mo mag-expand, mag-provincia ka, hindi Metro Manila. Ba't sa Metro Manila kayo nagdagdag? Ang usapan, exp ex expansion outside Metro Manila and uh, yung dagdag, uh, pag, uh, dagdag pag-aaral, extension ng pag-aaral, dahil nga kulang yung datos. At yung kayo mismo ang may kulang sa datos. Sa pitong-anim na taon, hindi nyo natapos. The LTFRB suggests to Congress to conclude the pilot study for motorcycle taxis by May. In conclusion, the transport group hopes that the issues within the sector will be resolved, especially since it's clear that Grab's purchase of Move It, even though the MC Taxi is still in its pilot phase in the country, is wrong. Binenta nila yung binenta ng Move It si Grab, tama? Kay Grab. Hinarang namin dahil mali yun. Diba? Wala. Da, ba, paano mo ibibenta? Pilot pa lang. Naglaba sila ng sinabi nila mismo, hindi pwedeng gamitin. Siya, meron akong kami record, tingnan nyo sa media. May record at papres ko sila, hindi pwedeng gamitin ni Move It si Grab. Ibig sabihin yung kanyang application, yung kanyang training ground, sila lang galing yun. Meron, nagsalita si E.D. Ron, executive director nila. Pero bakit hanggang ngayon tumatakbo? At ang ginagamit Grab, nakita nyo sa, sa, ano, sa may Cubao, lahat ng nakadikit doon, power by Grab. For Gun Mobile of Philippines, MJ Mondiha, SMNI News. Time to check the latest update in Europe with Troy Gomez. Troy. Good day, Franco, and good day to everyone. Here are the latest happenings in Europe and Oceania. First in our news, more suspects were detained by the Russian FSB in connection to the terrorist attack in Crocus City Hall that claimed more than 140 lives. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin called the brutal attack as an attempt to undermine the unity of his country. Carlo de la Peña has the details. Условием нашего общего нашего общего успеха, я сейчас только руководитель профсоюза об этом сказал достаточно ярко и эмоционально, является единство российского многонационального общества. Это главное базовое условие нашего успеха. И в этой связи, конечно, и судя по тому, что сейчас дает следствие, у нас есть все основания полагать, что главной целью заказчиков кровавого, ужасного террористического акта в Москве было как раз нанесение ущерба нашему единству. This is what President Vladimir Putin said on the Crocus City Hall attack at a meeting of the 12th Congress of the Federation of Independent Trade Unions in Moscow. Putin also added that Russia was an unlikely target for attacks by Islamic fundamentalists. Других целей и не просматривается, их и нету, потому что Россия не может быть объектом террористических атак со стороны исламских фундаменталистов. У нас страна, которая демонстрирует уникальный пример меж межконфессионального согласия и единства, межрелигиозного единства, межэтнического. И, и на внешней арене она ведет себя таким образом, что вряд ли может быть объектом для нападения со стороны исламских фундаменталистов. А вот цель подорвать единство российского общества, она, тем более в современных условиях, она безусловно просматривает. Meanwhile, Putin stressed that the Russian economy will not transition to wartime footing, despite the current circumstances. Мы не переводим экономику, тем не менее, на военные рельсы. Все у нас на данный момент времени достаточно сбалансировано. Не отменяем никаких социальных гарантий работников. Никаких. Мы их полностью соблюдаем. И не полностью соблюдаем, даже ужесточаем ответственность всех, ответственность всех органов власти за их соблюдение. И очень рассчитываю на нашу вот такую совместную, консолидированную работу для достижения общенациональных целей. To recall, in late March, unidentified armed gunmen dressed in military fatigues opened a fire in Crocus City Hall. The said area is a 6,000-seat multi-purpose concert hall where a popular Russian rock band was supposed to perform following the mass shooting. 
a massive fire broke out, engulfing the whole building. More than 140 people were killed, and Russian authorities captured several suspects who are currently in custody until May 22. While Putin said that radical Islamists were responsible, he also hit out at the U.S. for trying through various channels to convince its satellites and other countries of the world that, according to their intelligence, there is allegedly no trace of Kyiv in the Moscow terrorist attack. It can be remembered that the Russian investigative committee has said the Kroko City Hall attack had evidence of links to Ukrainian nationalists. U.S. National Security Spokesperson John Kirby called the Russian Investigative Committee's allegations nonsense and propaganda. Earlier, the U.S. claimed that the Kroko City Hall incident was a terrorist attack that was conducted by ISIS and that there was absolutely no evidence that the Ukrainian government had anything to do with it. Reporting, this has been Carlo de la Peña, SMNI News. Russia and Ukraine defended their military actions as the conflict between the two nations grinds on. Reports on Friday that Moscow forces had hit multiple Ukrainian facilities for several days with high-precision weapons and drones, while Ukraine stated on the same day that it had launched drone attacks on three Russian military airfields. According to reports from the Russian Ministry of Defense, from March 31 to April 5, Russian forces conducted 39 group strikes utilizing both land-based and air-based high-precision weaponry alongside drones. These strikes targeted various Ukrainian energy facilities, military installations, air defense sites, weapon depots, and fuel bases with all objectives successfully hit. In response, the Russian army has successfully repelled multiple counterattacks launched by Ukrainian forces across several fronts, including Kopyansk, Donetsk, and Advivka over the past week. Also, there have been reports of Russian strikes targeting Ukrainian military personnel and equipment. Russian air defense forces also shot down warplanes and more than 1,000 drones in Ukraine during the same period. Meanwhile, Ukraine attacked three Russian military airfields with drones on Friday morning, destroying and damaging planes, as per the Ukrainska Pravda media outlet, citing its source in Ukraine's intelligence. Ukrainian drones also struck a military airfield in Russia's western city of Kursk. Troops from New Zealand arrived in Solomon Islands to assist with the upcoming elections next week. Trisha Molina reports. The New Zealand Defence Force contingent joined their Australian counterparts in providing financial support and security in the Solomon Islands for the upcoming elections on April 17. The troops arrived in the capital Honiara aboard the Royal New Zealand Air Force NH-90 helicopters on Thursday. The 200-strong Joint Task Force will help transport polling boxes and election officials to various locations. New Zealand's Foreign Minister Winston Peters previously said the government will also provide funding for the preparation and management of elections in the Melanesian nation as part of the election support program worth 10.8 million New Zealand dollars. New Zealand also deployed a team of Defense Force personnel and two helicopters last month. The Solomon Islands is geographically dispersed, which means it can be challenging to ensure everyone has a chance to vote in the elections next week. Australia also deployed hundreds of troops to the Solomon Islands to provide security for the Pacific Games and the upcoming elections, including financial aid. Reporting, this has been Trisha Molina, SM9 News. Sweden supports the endorsement of some NATO member states to appoint the Prime Minister of Netherlands as the new Secretary General of the U.S.-led military alliance. Valdivina Grasha has the details. Sweden backs up clamor by the United States, the United Kingdom, France and Germany for Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte to take over as the new NATO chief. Jens Stoltenberg, the incumbent Secretary General of NATO, is set to end his term before the end of the year. Seen as a steady and patient leader, NATO allies last year agreed to extend Stoltenberg's term until October 1, 2024, a decision he said he felt honored to accept. President Joe Biden has declared support for Ruta to take over the job, although not publicly. 
Amidst speculations of Western support for the outgoing Dutch Prime Minister to lead the alliance, Romanian President Klaus Johannes last month announced his bid to become the next NATO chief. The Romanian leader called for consensus among 32 states to properly choose the next leader of the alliance. Romania has been a member of NATO since 2004. Reporting, this is Valdivina Russia, SMNI News. More news when the Week of the World returns. Magandang umaga, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. Maayong buntag, mga kapartner. Magandang araw sa buong mundo. Magandang araw, Pilipinas. Ito ang Pulso ng Bayan. Hihimayin ang mga pangunahing isyu sa ating bayan. Susuriin ang mga kinakailangang malaman ng taong bayan. Aalamin ang pulso ng bawat Pilipino sa mga pangyayari sa ating lipunan. Pulso ng Bayan, alas 7 hanggang alas 9 ng umaga, tuwing lunes hanggang biyernes. Kasama ang spokes ng Bayan, Attorney Harry Roque, Admar Villando at Jade Calabroso. Dito lang sa SMNI. Problema nyo, itawag kay Panelo. Ikaw ba'y may suliranin na may kinalaman sa mga ahensya ng ating pamahalaan? Inihahandong ng SMNI ang programang makakapiling ninyo sa araw-araw na maaaring ninyong maging daingan. Tampok ang dating Chief Legal Counsel ng nakaraang Pangulo, ang veteranong abogado na si Attorney Salvador Salpanelo. Bishops. Tulong at payo tagapamagitan sa ating mga lingkod bayan. Problema nyo, itawag kay Panelo. Lunes hanggang biyernes alas 9 hanggang alas 10 ng umaga dito lamang sa SMNI. Ang totoong boses ng bayan. Banateros tuwing Martes at Webes live dito lang sa SMI. Yan ang Banateros, yes! walang inuurungan Woo! pag tama palapakan pag mali ay babanatan Welcome to SMNI. You're watching Business and Politics. I'm Dante Klinkang. Today's world can be described by the acronym VUCA which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous and yet being immobilized by fear is not an option. How will captains of industry navigate the course ahead? And what policy assistance will they get from the leaders in government? Watch SMNI as it tackles these and other important questions of the day. On Business and Politics, hosted by Dante Klink Ang II, Chairman and CEO of the Manila Times. New episodes featuring corporate and political leaders air every Saturday, prime time at 7 p.m. Only here on SMNI, Truth That Matters.
makita mga kapartner. Simula na ang voter registration para sa 2025 national at local elections. Maaaring magparehistro mula lunes hanggang sabado, kabilang ang holidays mula alas 8 ng umaga hanggang alas 5 ng hapon, maliban na lamang kung ideklara ng COMELEC na walang registration. Kabilang sa mga araw na walang voter registration ay sa March 28, Monday Thursday, March 29, Good Friday, at sa March 30, Black Saturday. Paano nga ba magparehistro? Magpunta lamang sa mga opisina ng election officer sa inyong lugar o sa Register Anywhere program sites. Maaari rin sa satellite o mall registration sites. Narito naman ang mga hakbang para sa registration. Una, magpresenta ng valid identification document. Tapos ay sumailalim sa interview na isasagawa ng registration staff. Sagutan ang application form. Maghintay para sa checking at verifikasyon ng ipinasang application form. Biometrics capture at hintayin ang paglabas ng acknowledgement receipt. Sino-sino nga ba ang mga maaaring magparehistro? Ang mga nasa edad 18 years old pataas sa araw ng national at local elections. Residente ng Pilipinas sa loob ng hindi bababa sa isang taon. Residente sa lugar kung saan magboboto sa loob ng hindi bababa sa anim na buwan. Hindi diskwalipikado ng batas at mga hindi pa nakapagparehistro. Ano-ano ang may tuturing na valid identification documents? Philsys National ID Card, Postal ID Card, PWD ID Card, Students ID Card or Library Card signed by the school authority, Senior Citizens ID Card, LTO Driver's License or Student Permit, NBI Clearance, Philippine Passport, SSS or GSIS ID or other Humid Card, Integrated Bar of the Philippines ID Card, Professional Regulatory Commission License, Certificate of Confirmation Issued by the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples for Members of ICCs or IPs. Barangay Identification or Certification with Photo at anumang Government Issued na Valid IDs. Tandaan, hindi tinatanggap ng COMELEC ang mga sumusunod. Employer o Employee ID, Community Tax Certificate o Cedula at Police Clearance. Paalala ng SMNI, huwag sayangin ang iyong karapatang bumoto, kaya magparehistro na. Mahalaga ang iyong boses sa ating demokrasya. Nasa kamay mo ang kapangyarihan para sa pagbabago. Huwag ipagbili ang iyong karapatan. At sa darating na eleksyon, pag-isipan ng mabuti ang ihahalal na kandidato. Para sa Diyos at sa Pilipinas, nating mahal. We're back with more news and you're still watching Week at a World. Australia plans to hire an independent advisor who will examine Israel's official investigation of the death of an Australian aid worker killed by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Paul Montibon reports. Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong demanded the Israel preserve all evidence surrounding the death of seven humanitarian aid workers in Gaza, as the Australian government will be sending an independent advisor who will scrutinize the results of the investigation. Wong said the findings surrounding the death of Australian Zumi Francom failed to meet the government's expectations. The Foreign Affairs Minister condemned the strike that killed the Australian aid worker and six other colleagues in Gaza. And her online account. Australian Defense Minister Richard Marles will join Wong in writing a letter to their Israeli counterparts to present Australia's demands for the remainder of the investigation. The seven humanitarian aid workers who died from the Israeli airstrike in Gaza on Monday were Australian, Polish, British, and a driver who was a Palestinian, while another one holds a dual American Canadian citizenship. Meanwhile, Australian Prime Minister. Minister Anthony Albanese said he had asked Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to make sure the results of their investigation will be made public. I spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, we find out how exactly 
uh, this can occur. Netanyahu admitted that the airstrike was launched by Israeli's military and that hitting innocent people was unintentional. The Israeli Prime Minister added that these kinds of things happen during wartime, a statement that was widely criticized by Australian officials. Additionally, Major General Hersey Halevi, the IDF Chief of Staff, admitted that the incident was a case of misidentification, causing Australian officials to push for an independent inquiry, despite assurances of an independent investigation by Israel's military. The IDF completed a preliminary debrief. It shouldn't have happened. In a recent interview, World Central Kitchen founder and celebrity chef Jose Andres said the attack was not a mistake and accused Israeli forces in Gaza of deliberately targeting his aid workers. Andres noted that the three aid convoys hit by a strike clearly showed their charity logo, indicating who they are and what exactly they do as an organization. In recent years, Palestine has pressured Australia to recognize as a state. At present, Australia does not recognize the state of Palestine but does support a two-state solution, the concept of Israel and a future Palestinian state coexisting in peace and security with an internationally recognized borders. The tragic incident will serve as a diplomatic test of its impact on Australia-Israel ties and in the future of its foreign relation towards Palestine. Reporting, Paul Montebon, SMNI News. Moving on to the Middle East, Abu Dhabi will spend billions of dollars within the next 10 years to upgrade its infrastructure and boost tourism sector in the Emirate. Rinal Reyes tells us more. Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE, will spend 10 billion US dollars in upgrading its infrastructure to boost its local tourism industry. Just a few miles from the capital lies the bustling city of Dubai, known for its luxurious and multicultural vibe and record-breaking infrastructures. Abu Dhabi plans to introduce new theme parks, cultural sites, retail experiences and hotels as part of its tourism strategy. The Emirate is just one of the seven Sheikh Doms in the UAE, but the capital alone welcomed 24 million visitors in 2023. The UAE wants to attract nearly 40 million visitors in the next six years as part of its 2030 tourism strategy. The initiative will also generate an estimated 170,000 new jobs by then. Reporting for Week and the World, this has been Runil Reyes, SMNI News, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Meanwhile, students in the Gulf region are growing more disinterested in studying in American schools. According to a latest survey, Grate Omori tells us more. Universities in the United States have slowly lost their sparkle among Arab students in the Gulf region. An international survey uncovered the reason for their increasing discontentment. The number of Middle Eastern students enrolling in American schools declined in recent years. Between 2015 and 2023, the number of Emirati studying in the United States dropped to nearly 50%. Young people from neighboring Gulf nations are making the same move, with students from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait showing a significant decline. Schools in the United Kingdom, Australia, and Asia are becoming more popular among Arab students in the region. Personal safety, cost of living, tuition fees, risk of gun crime, and distance from families were among the factors considered by parents for their children who want to study abroad. An unwelcoming environment and potential attacks on students from Chinese and Muslim schools studying in the U.S. have also discouraged more students from enrolling there. Nonprofit organization Open Doors International conducted the survey. According to the survey, a few families still allow their kids to study in the U.S., especially if they enrolled at top schools. Due to the tremendous return of benefits and opportunities, it can give their children from studying in these institutions. Reporting from Dubai, I'm Gratero Omori, your Global Citizen Correspondent for SMNI News Channel. Meanwhile, Greece and India are on track to sign their first ever defense cooperation agreement next week. Kesha Boretta has the details. A military cooperation between the Greeks and the Indians is one step away from being signed, which will take place during the visit of Greece's defense military chief to India. 
Greek General Dimitris Hoopis, chief of the Hellenic National Defense General Staff, will visit the South Asian country next week. Staff from both countries are already making a draft on joint training programs and military exercises. The agreement also covers the exchange of military personnel and corporations in information, technology and innovation. The Greek general will discuss bilateral and regional security issues with his Indian counterparts during his visit. Once the military cooperation is officially signed, Greek fighters will step on Indian soil for the first time to participate in Tarang Shakti, the country's largest military exercise scheduled in September. The bilateral agreement will cover all three branches of military, the Army, Navy and Air Force. Reporting from Greece, I'm Kisha Barreta, your global citizen correspondent for God in our beloved country, the Philippines. Turkey cancelled its participation from an arms treaty that imposed limits on conventional military equipment in Europe. Mayflor Rodrigo has the details. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan joined NATO allies in suspending its implementation of the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, an agreement that dates back to the Cold War era. Erdogan signed a decree to officially mark his withdrawal from the pact. The Turkish Foreign Ministry made it clear that Turkey has not withdrawn from the pact but has only suspended its implementation, noting that implementation is no longer possible since Russia withdrew from the treaty last year. On November 7, 2023, Russia withdrew from the treaty after suspending its participation in 2015. The United States, Canada, Moldova and Poland followed suit. Signed on November 19, 1990 in Paris and ratified by the Turkish government in 1992, the treaty limits the number of conventional weapons and equipment owned by armed forces in 30 countries. The pact also covers information exchange and inspections. Increasing international attention urged Turkey to withdraw its participation from the pact. Reporting from Turkey, I'm Mayflo Rodrigo, your global citizen correspondent for God and our beloved country, the Philippines. Israel's military is on heightened alert after Iran threatened revenge attack on the death of its military advisors during an Israeli airstrike in Syria. Trisha Molina reports. The use of GPS has been blocked across Israel and all leave for Israeli soldiers serving in combat units have been cancelled as the country prepares for any potential retaliation from Iran and its allies. The Israeli Defense Forces has summoned reservists to boost its air defense units for any possible attack from Iran and its proxies. Israel has been on heightened alert since Iran threatened to avenge the death of its military advisors during an airstrike at an Iranian consulate in Syria on Monday. GPS systems in Israel have been disrupted on Thursday to prevent missiles and rockets from finding the location of any potential targets within the country. Residents reported they were unable to use navigation apps like Waze and Google Maps. In some instances, the navigation apps showed vehicles of civilians were situated in inaccurate locations like Lebanon and other places instead of Israel. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to respond on any attempts to harm the Israelis. A spokesman for Israel's defense forces has confirmed the military used a GPS blocking technique called spoofing to protect any Israeli targets and civilians from potential attacks. Reporting for Weekender World, Trisha Molina, SMNI News. Meanwhile, farmers have discovered unique methods to endure the current intense heat wave. Let's find out more about this report with MJ Mondihar. Over 1 million students have been affected by in person class suspensions due to the extreme heat wave. According to the data of the Department of Education, around 4,000 schools from 12 regions across the Philippines have shifted to online classes and modular learning. Pagasa Water for Casting Center warned that the intense heat caused by El Nino will persist until the first week of May. And to avoid heat stroke, some farmers have shared their techniques for coping with the summer heat. You can get um, a face towel or a towel Basahin nyo po ng ordinary water, tapos itapat nyo po sa electric fan. 
mga 30 seconds, no? That's called evaporative cooling. The water will evaporate, lalamig po yung tuwalya. Tapos yun pong ipahid nyo sa mukha nyo, sa balikat. I tell you, it's very cool. It's very effective. And it's very affordable. It's very cheap. It's free. Kong Hoon emphasized that as salt engineers, this is what they do to endure the heat even when exposed to the sun. Because we've been doing this business a long time, we know that we need to address that. So one of the easiest way to address is to make a cold towel. Ganun lang po yung gagawin nyo. But the Philippine Association of Salt Industry Networks or Philacine Group estimates that the salt industry contributes around 400 million pesos to the country's economy. This figure is expected to rise with the recent enactment of the Philippine Salt Industry Development Act aimed at revitalizing the salt industry in the Philippines. With this, a salt council will be formed to ensure unified implementation of the salt roadmap and expedite the modernization and industrialization of the Philippine salt industry. The government aims to make the Philippines an exporter of salt to other countries. Amidst the extreme heat wave, the salt industry is among those benefiting. One is definitely the salt industry is benefiting from an El Nino year. If you would like to take advantage of the hot weather that's coming, the global warming, I invite you to invest in the salt industry. For God of the Philippines, I'm Jay Mondehar, SMNI News. A lawmaker in the Senate is calling on the government to look for other sources of water as a possible gap in the supply is imminent amidst El Nino phenomenon. Troy Gomez has the details. Senator Wing Gachalian urged the government to develop potential water sources to address a supply gap amid an ongoing El Nino weather phenomenon. He pointed out that with a global supply gap in the future, the government needs to come up with a comprehensive program that would sufficiently bridge such a gap. The senator earlier filed proposed Senate Resolution 691, urging the entire Philippine government to make preparations to caution the detrimental effects of the El Nino phenomenon on all fronts, including water resources. At present, the Angat Dam in Bulacan province supplies more than 90% of Metro Manila's water needs. Initially, he proposed tapping Laguna de Bay as a water source for Metro Manila and adjacent areas. The legislator cited the recently released UN World Water Development Report 2024, which states that increasing global water scarcity is fueling more conflicts and contributing to instability. He emphasized that access to clean water is critical to promoting peace. The report disclosed that around 2.2 billion people across the globe have no access to clean drinking water, while around 3.5 billion people lack access to safely managed sanitation as of 2022. Currently, key local government areas experiencing water shortage include Cebu City, Zamboanga City, and the towns of Bulalacao and Mansalay in Oriental Mindoro. These localities have already declared a state of calamity in their respective areas amid water shortages. For God and my beloved country, the Philippines, Trey Gomez, SMNI News. Attorney Salvador Panelo comment regarding Risa Hontivero's statements against Pastor Apollo C. Kibaloy. On the other hand, Attorney Jare Roque believes that reviving the case against Pastor Apollo is a violation of his rights. Hannah Jane Sancho reports. Former Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Attorney Salvador Panella responded to Risa Ontivero's statement, which says, Pastor Apollo Sikibuloy's happy days are over in light of the issued warrant of arrest by the Davao City Visual Trial Court. Panello conveyed his response to Ontiveros through a song, which he said appropriately fits her personality. Ayan ang mga pretenders na tinatawag, mga hypocritical. Naalala ko tuloy yung kanta ni Jerry Vail. Oh, I'm the great pretender. Yan, bagay sa inyo yan. Mga Pretense. Panala further stated that Ontiveros and others intervening in the issue against the revered pastor are just politicking. The former presidential legal counsel also took a job at left-wing representatives Arlene Brosas and Franz Castro. According to Franz Castro, the decision of the regional trial court of Davao is an important hakbang sa pagkuha ng hostisya sa kanyang mga biktima habang sinabi naman ni Arlene Rosas and I quote, It is a stark reminder of who individuals who hold power and influence often exploit and abuse the, the vulnerable and of quote. Yan ang sinabi ni Rosas. 
Sa napakatagal na panahon, nagawa daw ni Pastor na umiwas sa hustisya. Dagdag pa niya, this raises serious questions about the network of enablers and powerful individuals who may have been directly involved in helping him conduct his illegal activities. An investigation must be conducted not only into his crimes but also into his connection as it is inconceivable that he would have avoided accountability for so long without active assistance from influential figures who are aiding and abetting him. Kayo yun. You're referring to yourselves. Kayong mga may hawak na kapangyarihan na nangaabuso. Kayong kayo yun. You aptly describe yourselves. Kayong dalawang party list. On the other hand, Attorney Harry Roque believes that the revival of the long dismissed case violates Pastor Apollo's rights. Yung apat na taon, na pendency ng petition for review kung, kung kailan ngayon ay biglang nabaluktod o na, nabaliktad, iyan po ay paglabag na sa karapatan ng isang akusado dahil mantakin ninyo, apat na taon nakabinbin yan sa DOJ, ay eh, yung nakabinbin pa sa, or, sa Piskalya ng Dabao. Matapos ito ay madismiss ng Piskalya ng Dabao. For God my beloved country, the Philippines, this has been Hannah Jane Sancho, SM9 News. We can the world will be back after the break. Magaluzon, Visayas, Mindanao. Maayong buntag mga ka-partner. Magandang araw sa buong mundo. Magandang araw Pilipinas. Ito ang Pulso ng Bayan. Hihimayin ang mga pangunahing isyu sa ating bayan. Susuriin ang mga kinakailangang malaman ng taong bayan. Aalamin ang pulso ng bawat Pilipino sa mga pangyayari sa ating lipunan. Pulso ng Bayan, alas 7 hanggang alas 9 ng umaga, tuwing lunes hanggang biyernes. Kasama ang spokes ng Bayan, Attorney Harry Roque, Admar Vilando at Jane Calabroso. Dito lang sa SMNI. Problema nyo, itawag kay Panelo. Ikaw ba'y may suliranin na may kinalaman sa mga ahensya ng ating pamahalaan? Inihahandog ng SMNI ang programang makakapiling ninyo sa araw-araw na maaring ninyong maging daingan. Tampok ang dating Chief Legal Counsel ng nakaraang Pangulo, ang veteranong abogado na si Attorney Salvador Salpanelo. Bishops. Tulong at payo tagapamagitan sa ating mga lingkod bayan. Problema nyo, itawa kay Panelo. Lunes hanggang biyernes alas 9 hanggang alas 10 ng umaga. Dito lamang sa SMNI. Ang totoong boses ng bayan. Ang 
Banateros tuwing Martes at Webes Live dito lang sa SMI Yan ang Banateros yes. Walang inuurungan Woo! Pagtama palakpakan Pag mali ay babanatan Yan ang Banateros Pag nakakakita ko ng salapi Nakikita ko ang isang biyaya Na nararapat gamitin At palaguin Pagkasama ko ang aking mga empleyado at manggagawa, nakikita ko ang ugnayan namin tungo sa tagumpay. Pag nakakakita ko ng daan, nakikita ko ang landas na karapat dapat tahakin maging ang mga sangang daan nito na dapat harapin. Pag nararamdaman ko ang pagunlad, nakikita ko ang hamon na mararamdaman ito ng lahat. Pag nakakakita ko ng papausbong na panimula, nag-aalab ang damdamin kong tulungan silang mas lumaki at lumago ng tuluyan. Ramdam ko ang kanilang pangarap. Kaisa ako ng kanilang pagsisika. Kasama ako sa kanilang pagpupunyagi. Panahon na para sa isang revolusyon, ang Entrepinoy Revolution. Dito sa SNNI. Nandito na ang mabuting balita ng negosyo para sa isang natatanging Entrepinoy Revolution. Kasama ang inyong Entrepinoy Guru, Dr. Carl Balita. Tara, ating paikutin, palaguin at pagyamanin ang negosyo mo. Dito lang sa Entrepinoy Revolution. ba kung ano ang cha-cha o charter change? Wala po akong idea man kasi hindi ako masyado nagsistay dito sa Pinas. Uh, wala po kasi akong ano, masyadong information kasi tungkol yan. Hindi po akong masyadong familiar kung paano po siya nag-work pero narinig ko na po siya. Uh, wala talagang idea regarding sa charges stay out. Oh. <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> hindi ako sure po. Ang pag-intindi ko sa charter change, pira yan. Ah. Ako talaga hindi ko pa lubos talaga na maiintindihan yan. Wala talaga akong idea, hindi ako ano talaga yung ibig sabihin ng chat-chat okay. talaga. Kung ano mas nakakabuti, siyempre, yun ang dapat maguhin. Oh. Ikaw lang yung ano, ikaw lang yung chat-chat. Mas maganda kung binabago para mapalitan yung ibang walang kabuluhan. Oh. Charter change, hindi ba yung sa tungkol sa DNR yun? Yung charter change, yun yung pagbabago ng saligang batas, no? yung Philippine Constitution ng 1987 ba yan? Oo. Ano nga ba ang dahilan bakit matunog ang charter change o ang pagbabago ng konstitusyon ng bansa? Ano nga ba ang ibig sabihin nito? Ang cha-cha ay ang legal na proseso para baguhin ang kasalukuyang 1987 Constitution na umiiral sa bansa. Maaaring isagawa ito sa tatlong pamamaraan, ang People's Initiative, Constituent Assembly at ang Constitutional Convention. Isa-isahin natin ito. ay ang People's Initiative na sadyang matunog ngayon dahil sa mga kumakalat na isyo tungkol dito. Ang proseso ng pagsasagawa ng People's Initiative ay nakasaad sa Republic Act 6735 o ang Initiative and Referendum Act. Batay dito, ang publiko ay maaaring mag-propose ng mga pagbabago sa konstitusyon sa pamamagitan ng pagkakaroon ng petisyon na pinirmahan ng aabot sa 12% ng kabuang bilang ng mga rehistradong botante. Ang bawat distrito rin ay kinakailangang maerepresenta ng 3% ng rehistradong botante. Mahaba ang prosesong ito at sinasabing magastos dahil sa mga kinakailangang isagawa para makuha ang kinakailangang bilang ng pirma. Dadaan pa rin ito sa verifikasyon ng Commission on Elections o COMELEC. Kung makuha na ang kinakailangang bilang ng pirma at matapos na mailathala ng dalawang beses sa mga pahayagan, ang lahat ng butante sa bansa ay magsasagawa ng referendum at magdedesisyon kung aaprubahan ba o hindi ang nasabing pagbabago sa konstitusyon. Kinakailangan ay sumang-ayon ang publiko para may sakatuparan ito. Magiging epektibo ito labing limang araw matapos na mailathala sa official gazette o pahayagan ng kadalasang binabasa ng publiko o general circulation. Ang Constituent Assembly naman ay binubuo ng lahat ng mga miyembro ng Bicameral Congress ng Pilipinas. Ito ay ang Senado at House of Representatives. 
sa ilalim ng Article 17 ng 1987 Constitution, ang mga pagbabago ay aaprobahan sa pamamagitan ng boto ng three-fourth ng lahat ng mga miyembro ng Kongreso. Ang mababa at mataas na kapulungan ng Kongreso ay bumuboto ng magkahiwalay para sa mga pagbabago. Sa Constitutional Convention, ang mamamayan naman ang buboto sa mga uupo para aralin at baguhin ang saligang batas. Mayroon ng limang Constitutional Convention na ginawa sa bansa. Nariyan ang Malolos Congress, Philippine Constitutional Convention of 1934, Preparatory Committee for Philippine Independence, Philippine Constitutional Convention of 1971, at Philippine Constitutional Commission na itinalaga noong 1986. Sa ilalim ng charter change, maaring ipanukala ang amendment o revision sa saligang batas. Mukhang pareho, pero magkaiba ang dalawang ito. Ang amendments ay yung mga pagbabago sa ilang provisyon ng konstitusyon nang hindi iniiba ang istruktura nito, habang ang revision naman ay tumutukoy sa posibleng pagsulat muli ng buong konstitusyon. ay ilan lamang sa mga pangunahing konsepto na dapat nating malaman kaugnay sa pagbabago ng ating konstitusyon. Kaya ano ba sa tingin ninyo ang pinaka-epektibong paraan? At ano rin ba ang gusto ninyong baguhin sa ating saligang batas? Panahon na nga ba upang baguhin ito? Hihintayin po namin ang inyong mga tugon. Patuloy po namin pakikingga ng inyong mga boses, mga kababayan. Dito lamang sa SMNI. Para sa Diyos at sa Pilipinas nating mahal. Kabayan! Oo, ikaw. Alam mo ba na you can win lots of prizes when you bring home a guest in the Philippines? The Department of Tourism brings you the Visita Be My Guest Program. Joining is easy. One, sign up as a sponsor. You can do this via the official BBMG website. All Filipinos of legal age living in the Philippines or abroad can join. Two, invite your guests. The more you invite, the more chances of winning. And three, travel to the Philippines and upload your proof of travel to complete the registration process and earn e-raffle tickets and the BBMG travel passport and privilege card that you can use to get discounts as you travel around our award-winning destinations in the Philippines. Join now and get a chance to win in any of the three raffle dates in 2023. So what are you waiting for? Come home and bring your guests to the Philippines. Sign up, invite friends and family, and travel to the world's leading beach and dive destination and the world's leading country destination for tourism, the Philippines. Visita Be My Guest in the Philippines. Magandang umaga Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. Maayong buntag mga kapartner. Magandang araw sa buong mundo. Magandang araw Pilipinas. Ito ang Pulso ng Bayan. Hihimayin ang mga pangunahing isyu sa ating bayan. Susuriin ang mga kinakailangang malaman ng taong bayan. Aalamin ang pulso ng bawat Pilipino sa mga pangyayari sa ating lipunan. Pulso ng Bayan, alas 7 hanggang alas 9 ng umaga, tuwing lunes hanggang biyernes. Kasama ang spokes ng Bayan, Attorney Harry Roque, Admar Bilando at Jade Calabroso. Dito lang sa SMNI. Problema nyo, itawag kay Panelo. Ikaw ba'y may suliranin na may kinalaman sa mga ahensya ng ating pamahalaan? Inihahandog ng SMNI ang programang makakapiling ninyo sa araw-araw na maaari ninyong maging daingan. Tampok ang dating Chief Legal Counsel ng nakaraang Pangulo, ang veteranong abogado na si Attorney Salvador Salpanelo. Bishops. Tulong at payo tagapamagitan sa ating mga lingkod bayan. Problema nyo, itawa kay Panelo. Lunes hanggang biyernes alas 9 hanggang alas 10 ng umaga. Dito lamang sa SMNI. Ang totoong boses ng bayan. 
Pag nakakakita ko ng salapi, nakikita ko ang isang biyaya na nararapat gamitin at palaguin. Pagkasama ko ang aking mga empleyado at manggagawa, nakikita ko ang ugnaya namin tungo sa tagumpay. Pag nakakakita ko ng daan, nakikita ko ang landas na karapat dapat tahakin maging ang mga sangang daan nito na dapat harapin. Pag nararamdaman ko ang pagunlad, nakikita ko ang hamon na mararamdaman nito ng lahat. Pag nakakakita ko ng papausbong na panimula, nag-aalab ang damdamin kong tulungan silang mas lumaki at lumago ng tuluyan. Ramdam ko ang kanilang pangarap. Kaisa ako ng kanilang pagsisika. Kasama ako sa kanilang pagpupunyagi. Panahon na para sa isang revolusyon, ang Entrepinoy Revolution. Dito sa SNNI. Nandito na ang mabuting balita ng negosyo para sa isang natatanging Entrepinoy Revolution. Kasama ang inyong Entrepinoy Guru, Dr. Carl Balita. Tara, ating paikutin. Palaguin at pagyamanin ang negosyo mo. Dito lang sa Entrepinoy Revolution. tuwing Martes at Webes live dito lang sa SMI Yan ang panatero yes. Walang inuurungan Woo! Pagtama palakpakan Pag mali ay babanatan Welcome to SMNI. You're watching Business and Politics. I'm Dante Klinka. Today's world can be described by the acronym VUCA which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And yet, being immobilized by fear is not an option. How will captains of industry navigate the course ahead? And what policy assistance will they get from the leaders in government? Watch SMNI as it tackles these and other important questions of the day on Business and Politics. Hosted by Dante Klink Ang II, Chairman and CEO of the Manila Times. New episodes featuring corporate and political leaders air every Saturday, prime time at 7 p.m. Only here on SMNI, Truth That Matters.
Attention to all motorists, a portion of the southbound lane of the Edsa Kamani flyover will be closed for 11 months starting April 25. This is according to the Department of Public Works and Highways in uh, preparation for the big one. Jason Rubrico, how's this report? The Kamuning flyover in Quezon City was built in the 1980s. However, over time, the condition of the flyover has deteriorated. According to Engineer Paul Chua of Department of Public Works and Highways National Capital Region, the deck slab of the flyover where vehicles pass has become fragile. Ang sitwasyon po ng flyover po natin ngayon na kung saan yung kanyang deck slab o yung mismong dinadaanan po na, ng ating mga sasakyan, ng mga motorista po ay rumurupok na po siya. Therefore, the Kamuning flyover, particularly the southbound lane, will undergo retrofitting to strengthen the structure in preparation for the big one as stated by the DPWH. Kailangan, kailangan na po na i-repair siya, na sabi naman po ng taga DPWH, although possible pa siya, it will pose danger sa ating mga motorista kung sakali nga po na magkalindol. Kailangan pong ayusin to make sure na Kung sakali, huwag naman po sana na magkaroon ng lindol sa atin ay hindi po siya guguho. Yun po yung purpose niyan. The DPWH project is set to commence on April 25 and is expected to last for 11 months. The agency mentioned that Phase 1 will take 12 weeks and will not entirely close this section of the flyover. Aside from the coming flyover, two major roadworks are also scheduled to start on Rojas Boulevard on April 5. According to MMD Acting Chairman Romando Artes, 14 odd road projects across Metro Manila will begin from 11 in the evening on April 5 until 5 in the morning on April 11. Furthermore, the MMDA will intensify its clearing operations on Mabuhay Lanes, serving as alternative routes for motorists to mitigate the expected heavy traffic due to these large-scale projects. In the coming days, especially leading sa pagsisimula ng mga proyekto na ito, hanggang ginagawa yung proyekto hanggang matapos, siguro mas paiiktingin natin yung sa mga lugar na nakapalibot dito to make sure na yung mga alternatibong daan ng ating mga kababayan ay malinis, walang obstruction, para naman hindi ganong kalaki yung maging epekto in so far as traffic is concerned ng mga in addition, private companies will temporarily be prohibited from conducting roadworks on EDSA, as clarified by Attorney Romando Artes of MMDA. This decision stems from past incidents where private sector projects were left unfinished. Yung decision namin na payagan 24-7, ang DPWH lamang ay resulta nga po na nangyari nung nakaraan na yung pong uh, proyekto ng pribadong sector ay hindi natapos. So, Kailangan po namin kasing mag-re-evaluate yung aming polisiya, particularly yung penalty system. As I've said, pinag-aaralan po namin na yung project owner mismo ay isama sa mga ipepenalize para magkaroon sila ng responsibilidad. Two subcontractors of Globe Telecom failed to complete 24 roadworks along EDSA during Holy Week, resulting in a fine of 1.260 million pesos imposed by the MMDA. For God and my beloved Philippines, I am Jason Rubrico, SMNR News. A security expert criticizes the ongoing government negotiations with the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, an organization linked to the New People's Army. MJ Mondihar tells us more. Presidential Peace Advisor Carlito Galvez Jr. said Thursday that consultations are still ongoing regarding peace negotiations with the National Democratic Front of the Philippines or NDFP. Uh, consultations are still un un uh, ongoing. We have visited uh, most of the camps and also we visited some of the provinces. We have already visited Western Mindanao Command. Uh, we, uh, we have also visited uh, Northern uh, Luzon Command and also uh, South, uh, Southern Luzon Command. However, the government has already designated the NDFP alongside the Communist Party of the Philippines and the New People's Army terrorists. Former Army Captain and Security Analyst Clemente Enrique said that there's no point for the government to do so. Position of strength tayo. Losing side ang CPP, NPA, NDF. 
Maling-mali yung kadalin mo, ibababa mo yung gains mo, nandito ka, bababa mong ganyan, para makipag-usap. Niloloko lang tayo ng CPP, NPA, NDF. He added that the government must not waste millions of taxpayers' money, our people's money, on meaningless peace talks with a defeated terrorist organization. Rather, it must focus its efforts in proven government interventions using good governance. Simple lang sagot doon. Meron kayong NTFLCAC. NTFLCAC. Kahit palit-palitan mo yung mga tao dyan, uh, successful sila ka Eric at uh, Lorraine Badoy, Access po sila. Ang laking thank you natin sa kanila, ang AFP. Hindi pwedeng i-deny yun. Thank you rin kay Duterte for, for, for uh, approving NTFL Cup. In November last year, the Philippine government and the NDFP agreed to resume the stalled peace negotiations after their representatives signed a joint statement for what they said was a principled and a peaceful resolution to the armed conflict. In separate news conferences, the two sides announced the joint communique that was signed in Oslo, Norway on November 23 last year and which averted to the need to unite as a nation amid socio-economic and environmental issues and foreign security threats. Uh, pinapalakas lang natin sila, binibigyan natin ng importansya. Hindi na dapat bigyan ng importansya. Dapat ang salita dyan nga, uh, surrender or die. Ganun lang. For Ganababal of Philippines, MJ Mondeha, SMNI News. Let's take a look at what's happening around Asia. Japan will provide aid to Taiwan following an earthquake that struck the island earlier this week. Hector Kikosaki reports. The Japanese government will extend aid to Taiwan for disaster relief and recovery work on the island. Tokyo will extend $1 million in emergency grant aid to Taipei and will be delivered via Japan-Taiwan Exchange Association. The announcement was made by Japanese Foreign Minister Yoko Kamikawa, adding that Japan will continue to support Taiwan. Her remarks also come as Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said his country is ready to provide any support necessary to the island. Meanwhile in Taiwan, emergency crews demolished the Leaning Tower in Walin. Workers used a huge crane to bring the debris from the top of the building. Ten people died in the earthquake and over 1,000 people were injured across Taiwan. Over two dozen buildings also collapsed in Walin, the epicenter of the quake in the island. To recall, Taiwan provided support to Japan following the Noto Peninsula earthquake earlier this year. Reporting from Tokyo, Japan, I'm Hector Kikuzaki, your Global Citizen Correspondent. For God and our beloved country, the Philippines. Meanwhile, the Japanese government will enforce a new system that limits the number of asylum applications in the country. And this will also allow the government to deport people who have been rejected many times. Shun Matsui has the details. Japan announced significant revisions to its immigration control and refugee recognition law, which is set to take effect on June 10. Originally, a provision protects asylum seekers from deportation while their refugee status applications are being processed. Japanese authorities said some asylum seekers have filed their applications repeatedly only to avoid deportation. Now, under the new system, foreign nationals will face limits on the number of times they can apply for asylum. This means that those who are filing for asylum three or more times will face deportation unless they provide compelling reasons not to be deported. These changes aim to address concerns over potential abuse of the asylum system where individuals repeatedly apply to prolong their stay in Japan. It also aims to reduce long-term detention in immigration facilities and streamline deportation procedures for those who fail to comply with deportation orders. According to reports, Justice Minister Ryuji Koizumi emphasized that the revisions seek to balance Japan's commitment to inclusivity with the need for fair immigration policies. 
and that authorities will closely monitor how the new rules will be implemented. It can be noted that the revisions have sparked debate and criticism from opposition parties and legal experts who argue that such measures could endanger individuals by forcing them back to countries where they may face persecution. Meanwhile, starting June 10, asylum seekers will have the option to live in the community under the supervision of family members or supporters rather than being detained in Japanese immigration facilities according to the country's immigration services agency. Reporting from Japan, I'm Shun Matsui, your global citizen correspondent for God and our beloved country, the Philippines. Indonesia's military is working on a plan to buy new submarines from France. Ranger Modiquilio will give us the details. Indonesian firm PT Pal signed a worth 1.18 billion euro contract to purchase two new submarines from French company Naval Group. The Scorpion submarines will be built in Indonesia and the technology will be shipped from France. The 72-meter submarines will have six launch pads, a capacity of 18 torpedoes and missiles, 12-day underwater autonomy, and can accommodate 31 crew members. It will also be shipped with lithium-ion batteries that will allow the vessel more efficient energy, a decreased snorkeling rate, and a reduced charging time. The technology will also make Indonesia the first country to buy a Scorpion submarine equipped with lithium-ion batteries. French weapons manufacturer Nexter Defense System also expressed interest in a long-term partnership with Indonesia. The contracts were signed in a light of warming relations between France and Indonesia, wherein both countries supported each other in international forums. Reporting from Singapore, I'm Renju Modikilio, your global citizen correspondent for God and our beloved country, the Philippines. A high-ranking official of the United States Treasury visited China for a top-level economic talks. To tell us more, Renju Medikilio returns. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen arrived in China and brought with her a tough message for the world's second largest economy. Yellen arrived in Guangzhou on Thursday and started her first day meeting officials on Friday. The U.S. Treasury senior official brought with her a tough message for a Chinese official where she had planned to relay her concern about China's overproduction in almost every sector such as electric vehicles or EVs, batteries, solar panels, semiconductors, and other manufactured goods into global markets. She said this issue could affect other economies such as the U.S., Europe, Japan, Mexico, and other major economies. A few days before her trip, Yellen called out China's overproduction in solar energy, electric vehicles, and lithium-ion batteries, which she said distorts global prices and hurts American firms. The visit will serve as a diplomatic test on how the U.S. official will address such a sensitive economic issue with the world's second largest economy. Yellen will hold a series of meetings with top Chinese economic officials starting this Friday until Monday. Reporting from Singapore, I'm Renju Mudikilio, your global citizen correspondent for God and our beloved country, the Philippines. Thousands of monkeys terrorizing residents and tourists in a Thai city were locked up by local officials for causing trouble. Chank Bongkon Pisamaygusson has a story. As many as 2,500 troublesome macabre monkeys will be locked up and transferred to a larger enclosure after authorities received complaints from residents of their increasing bad behavior. For decades, the macabre that roam in Loburi became a symbol of the city's local culture, which is known for its historic size and beautiful nature. However, the growing aggression among alpha males has been a cause of concern and a special unit was deployed to deal with them. The animals revered as a symbol of culture have been terrorizing residents by jumping between buildings, disturbing shops, making nests in temples, and snatching foods from humans, which sometimes resulted in scratches and injuries. A woman who dislocated her knee last month after a monkey pulled her feet to snatch food and a man who was knocked off a motorcycle by a hungry monkey 
cause outrage and renewed concerns among residents. Authorities thought it best to arrest the troublesome monkeys and lock them up in a bigger enclosure to lessen cases of humans and monkeys hurting each other. Authorities are looking for new ways to control the animals after years of dangerous encounters with residents and visitors, as well as several failed attempts to reduce their population have failed. Reporting from Thailand, I'm Shad m o n g k o n p i s a m a i Goson, your Global Citizens Correspondent for SM9 News Channel. And that's all for updates in Asia. Back to you, Franco. Yes, Troy. Thank you for the updates. Time to check the latest updates in North, South, and Central America. A stream of migrant com- migrants coming from Latin American countries gathered. For the latest caravan march heading towards the United States, Jade Calabroso has the story. These migrants are on a 1,700-kilometer journey from Mexico's southern border with Guatemala to the United States. As many as 2,000 people started this journey, men, women, and children carrying their belongings in backpacks while walking along a highway in the Mexican municipality of p i j i j a p a n A huge cross was seen being carried on the march, with the journey of the Via Crucis Migrante Caravan beginning during Holy Week in Mexico's Tapachula, c h i a p a s t e This caravan follows the departure of a group of approximately 6,000 migrants from Tapachula in late December last year. Pues esta caminata ha sido un poco dura, pero sabemos de que tenemos una gran esperanza porque habemos muchos que. Han sufrido algunos más que nosotros y así de los pies muchas personas con hambre eh, ya no quieren más sufrir pues queremos un futuro mejor. Pues viajo con mi hija con mi nieto y queremos cruzar a Estados Unidos para emprender verdad para trabajar tener una mejor vida. Porque en nuestro en nuestro país no lo pudimos hacer, mucha explotación, no hay fuente de trabajo y por eso hicimos de venirnos a arriesgar aquí, dejar todo allá en, en nuestro país. Eh, sí, me gustaría llegar a Estados Unidos, la verdad. Sí, ese, ese es mi sueño, llegar a Estados Unidos, no quedarme en México. Sí. Lamentablemente nosotros no estamos por los 110 dólares, nosotros queremos llegar a ese país. El país de los Estados Unidos estamos pasando solamente de pasada por por, por el Estado mexicano. Eso es lo que le pedimos a las autoridades mexicanas que por favor nos ayude con el formulario y con el FMM. Y por favor nosotros no somos delincuentes, somos padres de familia, gente humilde que ha vendido todo su ser, todas sus cosas para poder estar aquí. Reporting, this has been Jade Calabroso, SMA News. Mexico suspended its diplomatic relations with Ecuador after Ecuadorian police raided the country's embassy in Quito to arrest ex-Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass. The Ecuadorian president's office announced the arrest on Friday night. Reports said Ecuadorian police forcibly broke into the Mexican embassy in Quito. Ecuador to detain Glass, a move that further depended, dep- deepened the right between the two countries. According to the Mexican Foreign Ministry, the arrest is a flagrant violation of international law and the sovereignty of Mexico, the Mexican Foreign Ministry said. Roberto Canseco, head of the Mexican consular section outside the embassy in Quito, went outside. Reports said he tried to prevent the entry of the Ecuadorian authorities. However, Glass was later on arrested. Glass is found guilty by Ecuador's judicial system and had been holed up in the Mexican embassy in Quito since seeking political asylum in December last year. He was the vice president under the government of former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa between 2013 and 2017, and is facing investigations of corruption, bribery. And more in Ecuador. The Mexican embassy in Quito remained under heavy police guard following the incident. 
The press secretary of the White House was grilled by reporters when asked about the new bill on shielding journalists amid an ongoing attempt to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Carlo de la Peña reports. Journalism is not a crime and that the Biden administration supports a free press. This is the claim of White House Press Secretary Karine John Pierre when asked by New York Post reporter Stephen Nelson how the new bill on shielding journalists fitted with the attempted extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Um, without press freedom, our yeah. government appears to be closer to potentially extraditing Julian Assange. Um, press freedom groups say that the case threatens to criminalize our profession. So I'm wondering what the White House's thinking is uh, regarding that matter and the potential threat to press freedom. Does the White House have a stance on the pending federal press shield legislation to pass the House and that Senator Schumer told me he hopes reaches President Biden's bad death this year? The reporter was likely referring to is set to protect reporters from court-ordered disclosures of confidential sources unless there was a terrorism threat against the U.S. Look, and I said this, I've said this many times, I said this last week, where journalism is not a crime. We've been very clear about that. Uh, and uh, as it relates to this particular legislation, uh, I haven't reviewed it. would have to talk to our, our Office of Ledge Affairs on that particular legislation. But I do want to say, back in October of 2022, the Justice Department codified a policy to ban subpoenas of journalist uh, records. Uh, the President strongly supports the right of free and independent press. Despite her response, the reporter followed up by asking this question. Yeah, just to confirm, no stance yet on the Press Act that you're aware of. And the Assange matter, is there concern about that? Uh, you know, I, I don't have much more to share besides what I just laid out here. Um, so I'll just leave it as uh, what I just stated to you. John Pierce claims of journalism not being a crime and that the current administration supports a free press. Kama U.S. continues in its attempt to extradite Assange from the United Kingdom, with a case currently adjourned until May. Assange is wanted by U.S. authorities on 18 charges and is facing up to 175 years in prison after publishing thousands of leaked confidential military files and documents related to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, including the leaked footage of a U.S. helicopter attack in 2007 where it killed two Reuters staff and several others in Baghdad. Meanwhile, another hearing will be held on May 20th to determine whether America's assurances are satisfactory. The WikiLeaks founder has been battling with extradition in the U.S. for more than 10 years now and has spent seven years in self-exile in the Ecuadorian embassy in the U.K. and another five years at Belmarsh Prison. And in March, U.S. judges ruled that the U.S. should provide assurances that an extradition and the case would not contravene freedom of expression, wouldn't involve any prejudice during a trial regarding Assange nationality, and would not mean the death penalty in the case of conviction. And that Assange, an Australian citizen, is afforded the same First Amendment protections as an American citizen. Reporting, this has been Carlo de la Peña, SMNI News. In his recent statement, Pastor Apollo C. Kibuloy cited conditions that will guarantee that the United States will not meddle in the cases filed against him. The River Pastor also revealed that he already knows that the accusations hurled against him are part of America's playbook and its attempt for an extraordinary rendition. Cathy Villanueva reports. <laughs> Bawian ako ng buhay sa kanilang kamay, hindi ako papayag. Kung ang endgame nila ganun, hindi ako papayag. Ang endgame ko, mamamatay ako sa kamay ng mga Pilipino, okay sa akin yun. Basta nakatayo ako sa aking sariling prinsipyo, values, hindi ko pinagbili. This is what Pastor Polo C. Kibuloy of the Kingdom of Jesus Christ said in his recent statement released on April 6th. Amid the accusations hurled against him, Pastor Polo revealed that he already knows the ploy set up against him by the U.S. government in its attempts for an extraordinary rendition. O ngayon, maliban kung bigyan niyo ako ng garantiya na hindi mangingyalam ang mga puti, FBI, CIA o sino paman sa kanila, 
haharapin ko ang kasong yan. Simple-simple po mga kasong yan. Lalo na puro mga sinwaling ang kaharap namin. Dokumento po ang nasa aming mga kamay. Bakit hindi ko haharapin? Umiiwas po ako dahil ang playbook ninyo alam ko. Ang katapusan is extraordinary rendition. Mapasakamay ako ng mga puti. Magiging klaro em recto number 2 ako, mamamatay ako sa kanilang kamay, iyanaw sa buong sanlibutan, heart attack ang ikinamatay ko. Pero patay na ako. Yan ang end game ng playbook na ito. At hindi ninyo yan pwedeng ipagkaila. It can be noted that all cases filed against a good pastor in the United States are now being handled by all 22 lawyers of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. However, it has been postponed for three years by the other camp, with a trial set on November 5 this year. Pagka ako'y umatin doon, siguradong ang endgame po ay babagsak ako sa kamay ng mga puti. Extraordinary rendition pa rin. Nung hindi po nila magawa yun, kahit may mga waranto pa rin na sila, sapagat hindi ako umaaten sa kanilang mga hearing, kasi pinoprotektahan ko yung sarili ko, Kasi alam ko ng lahat ng ito ay patibong lamang upang ang endgame ay magawa nga nila na ako ay uh, ilagay sa kamay ng mga puti. Sapagkat ang ating pong gobyerno at ang gobyerno ng mga puting ito ay nagkasabwatan na nga, hawak na nga sa liig ang ating uh, gobyerno rito. Kaya itong mga operatibang ito ay ginagamit na lamang whether they know it or not Pastor Polo said traps were laid down by his adversaries, including the hearings conducted by the House of Representatives and the Senate. Yung sinasabi nilang wala akong, wala akong uh, hold departure order, pagkatapos sasabi nilang maging madugo kung sila ipapasok dito sa aking compound, yun po yung mga patibong din. Ang ibig lang sabihin, umalis ka dyan kasi magiging madugo, e lalo pa kung hindi aalis. Kasi ako'y tatayo sa mga illegal na activities na gagawin nila ng paglusob. Pastor Polo stressed that he will only show himself and face all these accusations with a condition that the United States will not interfere or meddle in the cases filed against him. Gusto ninyo akong lumitaw para harapin ang lahat ng ito? Ito po ang kondisyon ko. Oh, bigyan ninyo ko ng garantiya na hindi mangingialam ang mga puti sa kasong ito sa Pilipinas. Hindi mangingialam ang FBI, ang CIA, ang US Embassy. O, bigyan ako ng garantiya ng presidente ng Pilipinas. Bigyan ako ng garantiya ng, uh, ng uh, Secretary of Department of Justice, Boeing Remulia. Written po yan, ha? Written. Bigyan ako ng garantiya ng PNP head na si Marbil, General Marbil. Bigyan ako ng garantiya ng NBI head at CIDG. May garantiya na hindi mangingalam ang Amerikano at walang mangyayaring extraordinary rendition. Ako po ay lilitaw at haharapin ko ang lahat ng kasong yan kahit sa nyo dalhin dito sa Pilipinas. Maliban kung ibigay ninyo sa akin ang garantiyang aking inahanap, hindi po ninyo ako makikita. Sige, imanhunt ninyo ako. Ako'y tatayo na hindi magpapasakop sa injustice. Ako'y hindi, ako'y hindi magpapasakop sa tyrannical rule. Ako'y hindi magpapasakop sa oppression and suppression of my rights. For God and my beloved country, the Philippines, this is Kathy Villanueva, SMNI News. The Kingdom of Jesus Christ organized prayer rally in Davao City shows no signs of slowing down as they continue with the 18th day of this peaceful undertaking. With Pastor Apollo C. Kabuloy supporters expressing their relentless support to the good pastor. Sara Santos reports. Supporters of Pastor Apollo C. Kibuloy in Davao City, including the members and workers of the Kingdom of Jesus Christ, continue to lift up their prayers and supplications to the Almighty Father as Pastor Apollo and the whole congregation face political persecution and judgment. 
Pastor Apollo C. Kibuloy. As the peaceful prayer rally enters its 18th day, participants express their relentless support to Pastor Apollo, stressing that they are even willing to lay down their very lives for the man who changed them to be God-fearing and responsible citizens. Itong lahat na nandito ngayon, mga resulta ito kung ano yung mga pagtuturo ni Pastor. Nandito kami para sumuporta kay Pastor hanggang sa dulo at, and, and, and in our last drop of our blood, nandito kami para sumuporta kay Pastor. Forever Pastor, susuporta kami sa inyo. Sa pamagitan mo Pastor, kami po ay uh, patuloy na lalaban at lalo pa po namin panangatagin Pastor ang aming commitment, dedication, and loyalty kahit ano pong mangyari Pastor. Handa po kaming ibuwis ang aming buhay o ialay ang aming sarili Pastor para po maging uh, mada, ma, malagumpay ka pastor sa labang ito kasama po kami pastor kahit hanggang saan ano pa man ang kainat ng to pastor kaya nagkakaisa kami dito dahil nang hingi kami ng hustisya kung hindi man namin makamit ang hustisya dito sa lupa alam namin kaya kami nanalalangin gabi-gabi dahil hindi kami pababayaan ng amahan dahil mamatay man kami dito hindi namin pababayaan si Pastor kung meron pa kaming pangalawang buhay na ialay para ipaglaban si Pastor, gagawin namin yun hantol sa huling hininga ng aming buhay. These kingdom members and workers, as well as the supporters of the good pastor, cannot just sit down and do nothing as people mock and persecute the man who taught and showed them and their families nothing but love and compassion. Until the very end, mm -hmm. we are going to support until the very end because we especially from the Brazil, the Brazilian community. We know and we worry pastor. So those who worry pastor know about the integrity of our beloved pastor, about the charity, about the love that he's sharing, not only for the people inside of the King Donation, but also outside. Pastor, we know that all of these accusations and this war that is ranging against us, all of this battle that is ranging against us is making us more strong a very united family. Expect that as the days progress, these kingdom supporters will never waver and continue to shout and cry for justice for Pastor Apollo as oppression and suppression persist. For God and my beloved Philippines, Sara Santos, SMNI News. And before we end, may be inspired with the message of the appointed Son of God. Endurance is forged in the fires of adversity. And that's all for this edition. For more news update, you may visit smnanewschannel.com or follow us on our official social media accounts on Rumble, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. For God and my beloved country, the Philippines, I am Franco Baranda, and this is Weekend the World. This is SMNI News Channel. Truth that matters. Subscribe to SMNI News Channel and turn on the notification bell to keep you up to date. Also visit our official social media accounts and join our community on Viber and Telegram.